Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Conversations with Coaches podcast. I'm your host, Kevin, and today I have the pleasure of interviewing Graham Brown. Graham is the founder of Pickle and Company, which I wanted desperately to pronounce Pickle, but then I thought thought better of it, and it's just Pickle, which is one of my favorite words and favorite foods. <laughs> it is an award-winning, AI-powered, data-driven B2B podcast agency based out of Singapore. He's a published author on the subject of the digital transformation of communication with works including the Human Communication Playbook and the Mobile Youth Voices of the Connected Generation. Graham, it is a pleasure to talk to you. I'm excited to, to have a conversation and I'm already sad that we'll have to cut it at our usual 15 to 20 minutes. You're, a, you're an excellent conversation lesson, so I'm excited to talk to you today. Likewise, looking forward to this, Kevin. And I've been enjoying your podcast so far, so hopefully Thank I can you. add to it. It's, it's, you know what? It's pretty fun talking to interesting people about what they're passionate about. <laughs> Go figure. Oh, yeah. Who'd have thought? <laughs> yeah. How about that as a job? Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, so let's, let's go back to your, well, I like to sometimes call it the superhero origin story, how you got your start. How did yeah. you decide to move into what is functionally? I mean, you're almost like a, a podcasting guru, really like the, the how to top to bottom. How did you move into, how did you discover that you wanted to do what you're doing right now and move into the business that you have today? Okay. Well, I guess you got to go back if you want to do the superhero origin. I was myth. born. I was born. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How long have we got? 15 minutes? We've got to cover 50 years off. I, I was a storyteller. I am a storyteller, Kevin. And I think like many people, especially in the coaching space or, you know, anybody is involved in really helping other people in the corporate space will probably remember that storytelling was always something seen in the pejorative. As a kid, I was told off, you know, don't tell stories, you know, you'd get scolded by your mom. And I only really later learned in life and in, in business how powerful storytelling was. You know, if you look at all great business leaders, the one thing that they share was this ability to tell stories, whether it was gather around, you know, remember when we were at school, gather around kids, you know, telling a story, you know, you think about the power of gathering around now, you know, remote world or the power to lead the power to take people to the promised land, whatever it may be. I, it's something that we really need in business. And I think, you know, what I feel my role is, is with podcasting and I can see you doing it with podcasts as well is to really help people tell their story, you know, give them a platform and, you know, overcome that imposter syndrome that gets everybody. And, you know, there are tactical aspects of it. You know, there's the how-to aspect of storytelling. But mostly, I think, you know, like you and I have realized that on this journey, that once you get started, actually, you know, what were we worrying about, folks? Why didn't we get started? So I'm a storyteller. I help people tell stories through podcasts and I get paid for it. So I'm, you know, full <laughs> circle. I'm happy that I got scolded by my mom for that. <laughs> isn't, that the, isn't that the greatest, like, hero, hero story, hero origin story where it's like, you know what? I figured out how to take what I was already passionate about, what I loved from what I, what you realized was maybe your youngest of ages and turn that into profit while yeah. maintaining the passion. You know, it's like, you don't, a lot of people will think you have to pick one or the other. And in fact, that's a lot of one, that's one of those false dichotomies that we tend to fall mm -hmm. into quite a bit. It's like, I'm either like a storyteller or I'm not, you know, I can, I can pursue my yeah. passions or I can, you know, make money or something like that. They have these false dichotomies. And that's part of, I think, what a good like storytelling coach, sort of like what you mm -hmm. are, is great at is sort of breaking those ex those really false dichotomies, those expired notions being like, no, you can you can tell your story, you can live your story and you can have the life that you want to have. Let's just get started. You maybe just don't know the first couple of steps. Let's oh, do those yeah. together. <laughs> oh, that Kevin, that is so insightful that, you know, we don't live in this binary world where there are storytellers and non-storytellers. You know, we live yeah. in a very gray world. And I, I feel that a lot of people are disempowered to start that journey because they're too obsessed with either, you know, I need to find my why. I need to have this big, <laughs> you know, like overarching reason why I exist. <laughs> but most people aren't like that. Most people, you know, they only really find that in hindsight, you know, they start the journey. Many coaches start that journey. And only later on through many, many conversations, they have the hindsight through joining the dots to say, okay, there's a bit of context here. Maybe this is why all this happened in my life. And maybe the why emerges as a sort of post rationalization of that. So, look, you know, what we need to realize is that it's okay not to, you know, you, you don't need a finished book to have a story worth telling. I think that's mm -hmm. disempowering for people, you know, rather than finding your why, find your start, like you say, just get started. And that is the reality that 
most people maybe haven't realized yet is that actually, you know, you can have a, a story, you can be worthy of listening to without being an Elon Musk or a TED speaker. And most of us do have very interesting backstories and have done interesting things in our lives. And it's just getting that out, which I think is a challenge now. Yeah, I think a lot of us will get caught up in not only our own inner voice telling us what is and is not possible, but we're also like, we'll read the biographies. You know, we'll read the memoirs. And these are people who have, they're, they're looking backwards and telling their journey. It's like, save, save the why for, for your memoirs. Save the figuring out the why for when you're at that stage of the process. Because that, that's where it's going to be clear. That's where you're going to be able to see the hindsight being 2020. Yeah. Don't get hung up on that, though, because what you're seeing is the end of a journey and someone reflecting back on what came before. And using that to kind of explain maybe where they're going next. You know, obviously you don't have to wait until the very last day of your life to write that biography. And you can always write another one because, you know, <laughs> life can, life goes on. But yeah, getting hung up on that why, it really does, it kind of traps you or potentially traps you in listening to that that voice that tells you that you're it's not this, you can't do that. This isn't ready. I have to do this first. I need to know this first. All these different things that basically give you an excuse to not start which is why I'm always like for it, my internal voice and what I share with others whenever I have a chance, just tell people, Hey, just, just begin, just start mm -hmm. there. Are, there's not a wrong, the wrong foot you can put out there. Not at the beginning, like that, that, that stage of the dance is way farther on down the road and you'll know what you need to know. Then that'll take care of itself. If you're doing the right, if you're just starting now, I think a, a great coach I got to talk to a few months ago. And this is something that I've, I've, I remember hearing years ago, but then kind of came back to me from this coach. And I was just like, it's been in my mind for, it might be my quote of the year, something that I've been really trying to live with is, how's it go? Momentum is the antidote to procrastination. Mm. And it's one of those words. It's like, and obviously there's some other concepts you can put in there because procrastination has, has, has many children that go by many different names, just uh, excuses to not do something. And sometimes just begin, just like get some forward mo movement, get some forward momentum going, take the first couple of steps, be bad on a few podcasts, you know, mm. like stutter, say 17,000 times, <laughs> just go ahead, go ahead and do it. Listen to yourself, look at yourself, let yourself be listened to and looked at, take some feedback, take those first few steps. And I don't want to say it's easy because I don't know if that's the right word, mm. but it will, it starts to click really fast, faster than you could ever think possible in my opinion once you just take those first steps i know I'm, i think i'm talking more than you now I, I get so excited about these these first steps people can take and how exciting they are and how energizing they are oh yeah absolutely let's you know let, let's sort of not sort of underestimate the 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 times that the people that we see who are appearing effortless on stage they were once beginners too right kevin you know, even I think like you know, podcasting's like stand up comedy for a lot of people. And if you look at stand up comics, you know, you take famous stand up comics from, you know, yesteryear, people like Jerry Seinfeld, you know, he wasn't born funny. You know, he, like every comedian, none of them were born funny. They got on stage, they started somewhere, they went in front of, like you say, the stutters, they went in front and they, they told jokes that bombed. They went to the dive bars where there were five drunks who were heckling them. <laughs> That's what you've got to do in podcasting. You've got to start somewhere. And, you know, their process is very scientific. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a comic will go up on stage and practice material like you would on a podcast and, and get feedback in a very agile way. I call it agile storytelling, which is basically, you know, taking an agile approach to your story, which is never a done deal. It's, it's always test and then iterate and test and iterate. And, you know, like you say, it's like you, you don't really know the context of it until later on. And an author would do that as well. And, you know, the, the yeah. best books, they always write the introduction at the end. You know, mm -hmm. I only ever realized that when you sort of actually see the mechanics of how an author writes a book, you just think, oh, day one, once upon a time, it doesn't work like that. It's like you only I... know the context of it when you have that sort of top level view of things, but that comes yeah. in time. It does. It does. And it's, I feel, I feel like that's so empowering. I, I love that just relating like stand up com uh, comedy and the process and how scientific it is. I don't think people, enough yeah. people realize how, how much logic and like scientific rigor there is in the work. And it's, it's very much, you have an hypothesis. This will work. This might not work. You test mm -hmm. it. You get mm -hmm. immediate feedback. Like you, you get results that you can then fold into your next hypothesis that you can then test again. And the real, the hard part really comes into how you process that feedback because <laughs> that, that's where a lot of people will get 
and I'm, I'm spe- I shouldn't spe- say a lot of people, I should use my I statements where I would get a little afraid. I would get into my head and I would begin to fear whatever I was able to conjure that I could call rejection mm. as opposed to turning it as, as opposed to thinking of it as extremely useful feedback that I need in order to take the next step to make the next mm. move. And that's, I love the stand up comedy analogy, or I just, I love relating that because it's, it's so you hear stand up comics talk about it. I love hearing a stand up comic talk about the process because they talk yeah. about that. The, the thing they talk about the most is, working on new material, walking up on a stage with a stool and a notebook Absolutely. and bombing. And you're like, it was sometimes you, you rarely see this unless you go to comedy clubs a lot, but watching a really great comic work on new material and bomb and just watching yeah. how they roll and how they move. And you can see their mind working and they're gauging the audience. And they're like, and then you see them again, maybe like three, four months down the road, words said different here, sentences moved around and it's like it still feels very natural because they're they're honing and refining their craft and it's just it's really empowering to realize how scientific it is you don't often mm. think of performance like that as that straightforward but it really can be oh absolutely we only see the tip of the iceberg though right kevin That's we right. don't see the graft you know i've done like i mean probably today i've done over two thousand podcasts so I've got on stage many, many times, and some of them have like five listeners, right? But I take every single one as an opportunity. Like you say, I love watching stand-up comics talk about their art and their science as well. And I remember there's a documentary on Netflix, and why I brought up Jerry Seinfeld is that he was talking to the other comics about exactly that. You know, mm-hmm. what are you doing new material tonight? Did you do any new material? That's all they were talking about. You know, you would have thought comics would have been sitting around talking about their jokes, but they're not, they're talking about how much new material did you do? And so mm-hmm. I took that into podcasting as well. And I use the 80, 20 rule. And when I work with corporates or coaches, I talk about the 80, 20 rule, which is when you go to a podcast, it's a hypothesis you're testing. You know, you've got 80% of your material, which is your sort of regular set. If you like, you've, you're a done and dusted set. You've tested these, you refine these, but 20% is you take those existing sketches, those jokes effectively, you know, even that sketch that I told about a stand-up comic, that's not the first time that I've told it. I've sort of thought about that and refined it and tested it until it kind of worked. You know, maybe the first time I did it, the joke bombed. Like, <laughs> maybe they didn't get that. And then sort of, I get the feedback and try it again. And then, you know, I bounce the idea with Kevin and Kevin comes back with some more sort of insight into that. So I say that 20% is you try your existing content your stories, your delivery, the wording, the punchline in a different way. And you throw that out, see how the host reacts. You know, does it go over their head? Do they kind of like not get it? Or do they really double down on it? And what you get by doing that is they give you their insight into it. They give their sort of interpretation of it. And they will use different wording, you know, maybe throw in different analogies and context to it. And that just makes that set more and more robust. So that's the 20% pass. You always got to be testing it, always got to be like looking for feedback. And that's how you get better in an agile way in storytelling. I love this conversation so much. <laughs> this, this is like meat and potatoes for me. I love, I love thinking about this. I love talking about it. I love just thinking about things from like a, like a 1% angle shifted perspective and I'm seeing things in a new light. Yeah. Talk a little bit. I know we have relatively limited time. Talk a little bit about I mean, who you work with and how you work with them today for podcasting, like how you how you guide them, how you how you talk to people about being good on podcasts, which is something that I feel like I put that almost in air quotes because I feel like everybody feels like they need to be good on podcasts for themselves, start their own, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, how who do you work with primarily and how do you work with them? Okay. So there's two parts to what I do. One is I work with corporates so you know large corporations who want to create a human voice for their brand and in that sense they create a podcast because it's a great way to showcase what they're doing it's not advertising it's more like these are our people these are our views this is what we think about climate change diversity whatever people you know audiences really care about that now so that's one part of what we do and the growing part of what we do is podcast guesting so we're I work mainly with coaches and consultants in helping them get on other people's podcasts because these are stages with audiences which have been nurtured by the host. You know, the host has created a community. It may be 50 people, it may be 50,000. But the point is, you know, that host has planted a flag and said, this is what we want to talk about. This is what we as a community care about. And they have nurtured that community, talked to that community. So I help 
coaches and uh, consultants get in front of those audiences. And a key part of that obviously is, you know, finding the right audiences, but also for them to find their voice. Because, you know, I find Kevin, and I don't know if this is your experience, is the more experienced that coaches are, often the harder it is for them to get on a stage. Because, you know, if you're a beginner, you've got nothing to lose. You know, it's mm. like, I don't have a reputation. I don't have a set way, think of, you know, how things should be done. But, you know, if I have 20 years experience, you know, if, if I've been used to doing things in this way, you know, a PowerPoint presentation to this team or coaching in this way, then to be vulnerable and get on stage is quite hard. So mm -hmm. it's not impossible, though. It just requires a little bit of a tweak. So that's mainly who I work with. And, you know, as you can see that the work is not just this is how to do it. It's more, you know, focusing on them, their talking points and maybe overcoming some, you know, having a coach for a coach, if you like a storytelling coach in your team. And that's what I do. Absolutely. I feel like, well, a couple of things. First of all, every coach I know, every good coach I know has a coach in, in some aspect, whether it's just sort of a broad spectrum, like they have a coach for, for their business or they have a coach for their podcasting or their public speaking. I know, I know coaches who have, who have uh, keynote speaking coaches of their own that they kind of just met mm. through the, the coaching fraternity, the coaching family, I should probably more accurately say. So yeah, every good coach I know has a coach because they all know firsthand what it takes and what's important about getting better and just continuing to grow and understanding that, especially when it comes to something like a podcast, how, mm -hmm. and this is, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't I, I'm just gonna go ahead and say this, put this out there and we'll, we'll talk it out and refine it together. Vulnerability really is a skill set. It's not just, it's not something that necessarily, I mean, maybe to some, it comes more naturally than to others, but really being vulnerable in a way that's actually accessible, that allows people to connect with you is there really is a skill set to it. And it's something that you can, you definitely have to commit to in order to do it. You can't just, you can't turtle shell yourself and expect people to connect with you and, and share with you what they need to share in order for you to help them and for them to help you grow and change and, and proceed. But there really is a, a set of skills to it. And I love and I don't use that word lightly. I love that more people are seeing that and respecting that fact. And we're hearing these conversations happen in corporate environments. We're hearing these conversations happen on podcasts. We're seeing them happen in social media feeds in a way that's actually impactful. And I love seeing that. And I love that that's a very key element of what you represent and what you do is just yeah. to really, really help people who maybe seem like they have it all together. There's the well put together person who's just got this polish. They've been doing their thing for a while. But there's just an aspect that's just, it's really, I hesitate to use the word requirement, but is just highly prized, that ability to be vulnerable. I, I'm, I'm close to using the R word because it feels like a requirement. If you really want to be an excellent, like, like say coach, if you really want to be the best coach you can be, there, there really has to be an element of vulnerability to you because people will respond to that. Like they'll respond to really almost nothing else. Oh yeah. Well, look at every single hero myth we've been telling for thousands of years, you know, if Superman didn't have kryptonite, he would just be this sort of wooden hero. And we don't, you know, mm -hmm. even what going way back to, you know, Achilles and his heel, or, you know, mm -hmm. every single hero has a vulnerability and it's, it's a part of the plan. The reason why every hero has a weakness is because we can identify with them. If these here, if these heroes in whatever form they may be were somehow invincible, then they wouldn't be us. We wouldn't look at them and say they have vulnerabilities and faults and crack lines like us. You know, they wouldn't have, for example, our frailties or our flaws, right? And therefore not engaging and identifying with them, their stories would then become irrelevant to us. But the fact that these heroes do have this human frailty means that we can see ourselves in them. So if you put that in the context of coaching, the fact, or you put that in the context of the the people that people coach the clients of the coaches is that the reason why we need vulnerability and to express it is because that is the channel through which people engage with us right because if you come across as very very good at what you do that can be extremely off-putting and there's mm -hmm. a lot of psychological experiments done about that you know one famous one is I, I can't remember the name of the psychologist but it was conducted on students as they often are done is where they had the actors read a script through the radio to a bunch of students. And they read out this script and they asked these students to rate the competence of the actor. And so, you know, 
Group A listened to this really good actor read out the script and then they rated that person and then they repeated the experiment but with the twist and the twist this time was during the read the table read the actor deliberately accidentally knocked over a cup of coffee you know fumbled his way through and then got back into the script and then they asked him you know how did that actor come across and then they compared the results and in all cases the students rated the actor who spilt the cup of coffee higher than the one who didn't and now when we think about that is that that is why that is the business benefit if you like of why we need to dare to be vulnerable i like that. i like that if, if you if you dare to think about it it's it's it is it is a benefit it is a quantifiable value add <laughs> to be vulnerable oh, in yeah. that way and i just I, I i again i can't i can't say it enough i i just i love how that's become elevated in the conversation to something that is not just optional hmm. but terribly worthwhile and quite frankly i'll go ahead and use the r word required <laughs> oh yeah oh, absolutely we have already been chatting for nearly a half an hour i could <laughs> I, I feel like i say this a lot. i feel like a broken record because I, I mean i talk to people like you and it's just it's a delight but i keep i keep wishing that it would turn from 30 minutes to three hours but this is this is not the tim ferris show this is this is not <laughs> it's not one of those kind of interviews. so before i let you go and probably sneakily invite you back for a part two sometime oh, early yeah. in 2023 a little a little post new year's where can people i kind of i, I like to two-part this a little bit where can people find out more about you and what you do, find out more about Pickle, and also where can people best connect with you if they wanted to actually start a conversation? Yeah, go to my personal website. This is the good starting point. That will go to all my podcast work as well as the podcast agency and podcast guesting. So that's grahambrown.com. So, you know, the D is essential here because there is a grahambrown.com, which is a wallpaper company. So very different <laughs> experience entirely. So Graham D. Brown, D for David brown.com it's all there reach out to me on linkedin that's the best place you know that's where i post my content and i'm always there so i'm happy to chat if you've got any questions or any comments observations i would love to hear from you do yourself a favor audience that you're, you're listening just you've, you've heard this conversation you're probably as hungry for more as i am so yeah do yourself a favor and just and just reach out connect with connect with graham on linkedin go to his website Graham, this has just been delightful. I know I, I feel like I, I've blown too much smoke up your butt, maybe, but like I just this was, a, this was this was exactly the conversation I was hoping to have. So thank you for. I mean, I already have my expectations pretty high. I I've learned not to lower them, especially for this podcast because they just belong up here. You have you have met and exceeded them. So thank you, and I'm totally going to greedily ask for more in the not too oh, distant yeah. future. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sold. I'm on. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. You're a great host, Kevin. You bring thank the you. energy and the enthusiasm. It's it. Thank you. I got to learn to accept those those kinds of compliments. And you guys make it easy. You make it so easy. <laughs> thank you for allowing me to channel that energy and enthusiasm and sometimes even be a little bit silly in service of something that I'm pretty passionate about. <laughs> so thank you, Graham. Thank you, audience, for listening. And hey, you know it. We'll talk to you again so soon. <laughs>